Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, James Corliss. We're really delighted that uh, we've got so many of you joining the webinar this afternoon. Uh, that, is, again, is really such a timely issue, talking about the federal budget, uh, transportation funding in particular, uh, and what developments in D.C. really mean for the six-county SACOG region. Um, we have a great lineup today. Uh, got some excellent speakers. Um, just want to um, uh, introduce, uh, uh, tell you who we've got. I'm going to talk a little bit about the overview of the agenda, and I'll hand it off to Beth Osborne. So um, in, in terms of speakers, we're really delighted to have Beth Osborne, uh, my former colleague, and who is now Vice President for Technical Assistance at Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. Uh, Beth has years of experience um, serving in the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, and as well as on, uh, on Capitol Hill in the Senate as a member, and is, um, is, is really uh, just, we're, we're so delighted to have her expertise and her insight exactly um, what's, been, what's been happening in D.C. So uh, we've also got Matt Carpenter, our Director of Transportation Services here at SACOG. As long as we can patch him in from, uh, from sunny Florida, he will be uh, uh, giving a little bit of his take on uh, what the budget means specifically for uh, the SACOG region for the transportation programs and grants. Uh, and I'm finally also joined by Eric Johnson, who's our manager of policy administration at SACOG, who handles a lot of our federal and state advocacy as well. Uh, and um, let's talk a little bit about the agenda, what we're here to talk about today. Uh, there are a number of things, and we really do hope to um, sort of um, illuminate and clarify, I think, some of the uh, the talk that's out there about either it's a trillion dollars that's going to uh, we're, we're all going to get for infrastructure and transportation projects, or we're going to get budget cuts. I think a lot of uh, confusion and uncertainty reigns um, both in D.C. and perhaps here at home. But I, but we're we're going to cover and and Beth and Matt are really going to uh, get into some of the details about um, the fact that we've actually uh, we've just completed the. Um, deal for to complete the FY17 budget, but the budget that you have heard about and we'll be working on, and the Congress will be working on the next few months um, towards the end of the year, is the FY18 budget. So we had what was called the skinny budget that was released earlier this year, just a couple of months after President Trump took office, uh, but we now have a, a lot more details about where the President's budget proposal is heading, uh, what that means to the SACOG region, and Dan, again, to remind everybody. Really, just the first, um, the first uh, foray really into uh, developing the budget that Congress is 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 going to write in earnest um, in the months ahead. We've also talked, and we will talk about the infrastructure proposal. Actually, separate from but included in uh, the budget is this notion of uh, is there does there need to be um, a big infusion. Of, of funding to help the nation's infrastructure repair dams and levees and roads and rail systems and, and airports, uh, as the president has been talking about this week in particular. What does that proposal look like? What does it mean for the SACOG area? How do we take advantage of it? Is it real money? Is it financing? Um, and what happens next? And then we're going to get into a couple of grant opportunities and uh, want to end on some technical assistance that we think uh, will be um, You'd be well well uh, uh, served to take from both us here at SACOG and USDOT. So we've got a lot on the plate. Let's get into the agenda. And I first want to tr turn it over to Beth Osborne from Transportation for America. Beth, we're delighted to have you here. Um, we know you know our region really well, and you know D.C. like the back of your hand. So, so tell us what we need to know. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I wanted just to, I know that you all have worked with Transportation for America in a number of different ways, but I still thought I'd start by just reminding you who we are. Uh, we are a, a national nonprofit that works with cities, towns, and suburbs to realize their visions for economic success. Uh, we, we like to work with um, uh, transportation experts like yourselves, uh, MPOs, transportation agencies, but also um, local elected officials, which there's some overlap there, obviously, and chambers of commerce. And the goal is to make sure transportation decision making is happening on a local and a regional level where people move around most frequently. Um, I posted in the uh, PowerPoint that you all are looking at the um, 
uh, some of the reports that we've done that are useful for, for people who are involved in transportation from the state of bridges to um, we, we tend to do a pretty in-depth analysis of all the transportation proposals and bills that pass out there and we follow um, votes for transportation funding across the country as well including what seems to work well and where people run into trouble and in seeking more money for transportation. But moving into a discussion on the budget, um, I'm sure that folks have uh, heard lots of coverage of the budget generally, and uh, it's no secret that there are some pretty heavy cuts in this budget for discretionary domestic spending. Then that is uh, also true for transportation. Um, however, because of the structure of our transportation program, only certain parts of the program are discretionary. So the trust funded parts of the program uh, continue to function uh, as they would under the FAST Act, but there, there's a, an agreement in the FAST Act that there are certain uh, parts of the budget that will be maintained as part of appropriations, uh, and that is that's the transit program to keep the 80% the funding for highways and 20% funding for transit, often called the 80-20 split, which is generally the agreement that keeps the overall trust funded program supported across the board. Um, this budget cuts DOT by 13%, and that includes big cuts to transit, big cuts to passenger rail, the ending of the Tiger program, and there's also a, a proposal to add a new fee to inland waterway traffic, which is a proposal we've seen before from administrations trying to make sure there's enough, enough funding to maintain the inland waterways. We're going to move on and get into a little more detail on this. Uh, in terms of transit, we are looking at a cut of $928 million. Um, but I think what is more important about the transit language is the continued proposal that there be no new transit project, big capital transit projects. So what the budget says is they will fund the existing full funding grant agreements. Those projects that the project sponsors have signed a contract with the federal government to, to fund a project, if, if those are already signed and in the works, they will continue with those. But if you are you know, moving through the project development process and hoping to get a full funding grant agreement today, they, they say no, no more full funding grant agreements will be signed, no new projects will come into the program. They've completely ended the Small Starts program altogether. Um, and they have some very specific language in the budget that refers to transit projects as uh, localized projects. Um, and what they said was future investments in new transit projects would be funded by the localities that use and benefit from these localized projects. Um, I find that interesting language considering we fund a lot of localized projects in the federal program. We do intersection improvements for safety and things like that on our roadways, um, and whether or not it is of local benefit is not what we look at, but um, that's the language they use here. They also set a site specifically in the budget that many local communities have been quite successful in passing measures to raise local revenues for transit, and they use that as evidence that localities can handle transit on their own from here on out. So. Um, uh, even the support for transit at the local level is cited as a reason to go forward with no more transit uh, funding at the federal level. Um, however, after taking such a strident position, they did sign a full funding grant agreement for the Caltrain project. So there is some, uh, there is some reason to believe that maybe they will waiver on that to some extent, but um, there was a lot of pressure put on uh, the USDOT to sign the full funding grant agreement for the Caltrain project, so it may take that level of pressure to get them to act. Before I move on, the one last thing I want to mention here is signing a full funding grant agreements are not a budget issue. It does not require Congress to do anything. 
Um, all these other issues we're going to talk about, Congress has generally said, thank you for your suggestion, we'll now write the bills, and they make decisions about the funding levels for, for projects. But when it comes to moving a capital project, a big new capital project in transit, it requires a cooperative Federal Transit Administration. And if they are going to stand by this policy position that there will be no new transit projects that they will approve, it's hard to imagine how Congress can compel them to do that without some unique legislation. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so in terms of some of the other changes, as I mentioned here, grants to Amtrak are slashed by nearly 45%. Um, and there are very little for funding at all for long distance train routes. Um, the, the language of the budget says that long distance trains are a vestige of when train service was the only viable transcontinental transportation option. Today, communities are served by an expansive aviation, interstate highway, and intercity bus network. And so they're saying trains should just not be a part of that anymore. They have completely proposed the, the ending of the TIGER program. Um, and as I mentioned, a new fee on inland waterways and the end of essential air service program as well. Um, they also included Moving on to the next slide, a, a six-page uh, briefing on their concept for a new infrastructure package at the same time. Um, this was still a relatively high-level document with um, some of the, their principles and concepts in mind. Uh, and some of the things that it included is the expansion of the, the TIFIA program, which is the Transportation Loan Program. Um, and also the WIFIA program, which is the water version of the transportation loan program. Um, lifting a cap on private activity bonds, which allow private uh, activity bonds to get similar benefits of public bonds. The restart of the urban partnership program. Now, folks might have forgotten what that is, but in the Bush administration, they took some recovered funds from New Start's projects that came in under budget, and they created a really interesting and innovative um, co a program that regions had to compete for, where uh, they would get funding to institute a competitive, I'm sorry, a, a congestion pricing program. Um, and so this proposal suggests bringing that back, which uh, is a very interesting proposal. Uh, they also suggest allowing for more polling, including on federal infrastructure, requiring a greater local match on Corps of Engineers projects, and what they call corporatizing uh, the air traffic control system, which uh, they mean, that's their term for privatizing. Um, they have some language that talks in general about reevaluating the role of the federal government in infrastructure investment. Um, they point out that the interstate system, uh, well, they, they give an example. They, in their opinion, the interstate system is being maintained by the states with the federal government as a complicated and costly middleman that collects revenue uh, and then hands the expenditures to the state. So they're suggesting that it might be worth taking the federal government out of that mix. Um, it's one of the things that they are willing to consider, at least. Um, moving on, their proposal also includes um, some ref reform to the Environmental Review Program, um, which people tend to shorthand by calling NEPA reform, which stands for National Environmental Policy Act. However, I'll point out that a lot of the reform has nothing to do with NEPA at all, and a lot of environmental rules, uh, have, they have separate statutes altogether. But a, a smart transportation agency does all of their environmental uh, reviews as part of the NEPA process, so the shorthand is NEPA reform. They have proposed creating pilot programs on environmental performance. Um, there's not a lot of detail on that. It's just a notion that um, there are inefficiencies in the system and that they want to propose some pilot programs to experiment with different ways that projects could perform better and enhance the environment. No more detail than that. Um, accountability for permitting agencies. What they mean by that is that they feel the review and permitting a project should be included in every agency's mission 
and their performance should be tracked and measured. What's interesting here is it does not seem to say that the DOT's performance or transportation agency's performance on NEPA review should be measured. And I will say, and in my experience from, from working at the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, the same law as applied in different states, uh, it, it is implemented in very different ways. And if we're looking at accountability, it, it might be good to not just rate the, the review of the permitting agencies, but also the transportation agencies, because some of them are able to get very good results. And by identifying who's doing the best, we might be able to really um, capitalize on some best practices. Uh, the third item is um, they want to have one federal decision. Uh, and this is a, a complaint we regularly hear that project proponents have to navigate through a complicated federal environmental review process on their own. And it can involve a bunch of different agencies and uh, people feel like those agencies point fingers at each other and leave the project sponsor having to figure it out on their own. So uh, what they want to do is create uh, a system where there's a single entity that the project sponsor works with and it's that federal agency's job to deal with all the other permitting agencies. No details on how that would be done, but that is a concept. Um, Let's see, uh, they also talk about devolving permitting to state and local officials, which I know California has uh, uh, been very interested in as well. Um, the, they say that the administration supports putting infrastructure permitting into the hands of responsible state and local officials, but they don't really say much more than that. Um, and then curtail judicial reform. Uh, this is something that we've talked a lot about in the past where how to limit judicial review and some judicial review times have been shortened and some things are no longer reviewable at all. For example, when you first start to create a transportation project, the first thing you do is make a statement of the quote purpose and need unquote of the project. That is no longer reviewable. So a purpose and need under the law is supposed to be you know, something like um, address the high crash rate at X location. Um, instead, now you can put your solution in. You could say address the, the crash, high crash rate by building a bypass and then foreclose a lot of alternatives that you might have to review. And that's now the courts can't look at that to see if you did a good purpose and need statement. The administration is proposing to go further to make environmental document, documentation, as they call it, quote, litigation proof. And one of the things that we have heard they mean by that is to um, basically deem reviews by environmental agencies done by a date certain whether they are or not, um, and, and then not allow uh, the courts to review that. So uh, we'll be hopefully seeing more information about exactly what they mean by that going forward. Um, moving on, the overall principles for an infrastructure package are to make targeted uh, federal investments. And what they mean by that is to focus federal dollars on, on what they consider to be the most transformative projects and processes. Um, when federal funds are provided, they should be awarded to projects that address problems that are a high priority from the perspective of the region or the nation or projects that lead to long-term changes in how infrastructure is designed, built, and maintained. I'm hoping that uh, we will see from them maybe in a strategic plan or uh, one of the first rounds of competitive grants what, what they are looking for, what are the sorts of benefits that this DOT defines as uh, high priority outcomes. The second one is encouraging self-help. Uh, it says many states, tribes, and localities have stopped waiting for Washington to come to their rescue and have raised their own dedicated revenues on infrastructure. California certainly has. It says local localities are better equipped to understand the right level and type of infrastructure investments in their communities, and the federal government should support moving towards that model. Um, a, a very, a really good point. Um, what's interesting is on the transit side, they use that as an excuse to not support them anymore. Um, but uh, encouraging self-help is something that I think that they will find great bipartisan support for. 
Uh, third is align infrastructure investment with entities best suited to provide sustained and, uh, and efficient investment. By that, they, they mean that the federal government provides services that non-federal entities could deliver more, efficiency, er, more efficiently in their point of view. The administration wants to look for opportunities to divest from certain functions which provide better services for citizens and potentially budgetary savings. And they don't get into a lot of detail about that, what that means, but we see some of uh, an example of what they might be talking about with the corporatization of air traffic control. And then the last one is to leverage the private sector um, and to encourage much more engagement through public-private partnerships and things like that. Um, the overall response from Congress of these proposals, both the budget proposal and the infrastructure proposal was, um, we appreciate your, uh, your proposal and we're gonna go write our own bills. Um, it was really received a very flat response, including from the president's party. Um, several members of Congress uh, pointed out, including some very conservative members, that they don't think that this proposal uh, could get enough votes to pass. Um, but I think some of those members of Congress are not recognizing some of the challenges that they're going to have in writing these bills. So let's move on and talk about the schedule that's before us and uh, other things that are going to be going on that might impact the budget discussion. Um, in terms of the schedule, the way that this process works typically is Congress should now pass a budget. And from that overall guiding budget document, there are specific allocations of funding given to each subcommittee to write their bill. Um, so for example, you pass a budget and it would reserve a certain amount for transportation and then they would be able to go to the transportation, housing and urban development subcommittee to write the T-HUD bill and they would say, you have this amount of money to write your bill you figure out what to do with it. Um, what's more likely to happen here is there won't be a formal budget process uh, that we go through in Congress, but they will develop an allocation of the, uh, the appropriation funds. They'll send some notice to the appropriation subcommittees and say, you can't spend more than this amount on your bill. Now go write your bill. Um, at the same time, we are staring down a debt ceiling vote uh, the, the authorized level of debt that the nation is allowed to carry is quickly being met and Congress has to vote to raise it, which is um, something that happens periodically. It used to happen a little in a more standard way. Now it's become a highly politicized process. And the last time we had a debt ceiling increase, there uh, had, was a deal struck to put caps on, on spending. And there's some discussion that that will be required again this time in order to get particularly Republicans from the House to, uh, to allow a debt ceiling increase to go through. Without a bunch of conservatives from the House on that vote, um, the Speaker Ryan would have to uh, break what they call the Hastert rule, which means you pass a bill without the majority of the majority party, and you have to rely heavily on the Democrats to pass the, the vote, the Democrats are not going to likely want to collaborate, so um, they will either extract a very high price for the support or just not give it. So this is all going to happen right when appropriations bills are being written, and it could put some big pressure to lower the amount of money given to each subcommittee to write their bill. And so it's one thing for members of Congress to say, Yes, it's, uh, we don't like those budget cuts in the president's budget, but if, if they have to cut a deal to get a debt ceiling vote through, they may be staring at some very unfriendly numbers and have to make very hard choices. And I just have not gotten the sense that they have come to grips with that at this point. Um, the end of the fiscal year is on September 30th, so theoretically you want to have all the appropriations bills passed by the House, Senate, conference and then sent to the president and signed by September 30th. That is not going to happen. That never happens anymore. 
Um, so if we get to the end of the fiscal year, uh, theoretically they will have passed a few bills, maybe like, you know, two or three of the bills. They will pass what they call a continuing resolution while they work out the rest of them, which will either be worked out one by one or in block in what they call an omnibus. Um, the conclusion of the 2018 budget is likely by the end of the year. Um, there's no uh, federal election this year, so they can kind of work straight through to the end, no matter um, how long it takes. And then uh, an infrastructure package is, well, we've heard a lot of talk about it coming up in the fall. You might think, considering what I just told you about the appropriations bill, that this fall sounds pretty crowded. I would say to you that you are probably correct. Um, so while folks hope that there could be an infrastructure package and a tax package in the fall, and maybe the two could be combined, it's more likely to me that we might start having conversations about proposals, but we wouldn't really see any action on anything to the spring because they will be completely overwhelmed by trying to get the budget done. Um, and, and I will say that one of the things that I've heard from uh, the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate, um, uh, Senator Barrasso, is that he's looking at what marker bills are being introduced by members of the Senate on transportation issues to be rolled into an infrastructure package. So if there are changes to the program that matter to your region, you should talk to your congressional delegation now about introducing a bill just as a marker on the issue, it doesn't have to be perfect and done. It's just to, to give them an idea of generally the, uh, the sort of reform you want to see, and then it will be wrapped into that debate as a, a, a package is put together, if a package is put together. Moving on to competitive grants. So we, we just talked all about the fiscal year 18 process, the, the budget that starts in, uh, on October 1st of this year and goes through to September 30th of 2018. But there's a lot going on in 2017 that's already funded that you all should be paying close attention to. There's a whole slew of competitive grant programs now um, that this administration is going to need to put on the street. Um, there's Some of them are trust funded uh, and, and protected. Some were appropriated in the last bill, the, the FY17 bill that was passed just last month. Um, so I've got a list of them here. Um, I, I do want to point out that there's some interesting factors in each one. Um, bus and bus facilities had a very large focus last time on zero and low emissions buses. Not clear that that will be the priority again this time. The TIGER program, this is the first round by the Trump administration. Um, it is my understanding they're looking to make some pretty significant changes to the priorities there. So um, we, we should be in any meetings with DOT trying to get as much information out of them on what, what their priorities are going to be so that we can prepare uh, the right sort of project to submit for TIGER. Um, the fast lane program was authorized in the last uh, big authorization bill known as the FAST Act. It's a, a highway freight program. Um, and there are applications in currently for the second round that were submitted back in January, and this administration hasn't made any announcement on those grants. So, um, you know, we should be pushing them to make that announcement, and then they have a third round that they should implement sometime probably this fall. There's a new program called the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Program, or CRISI. And that was also created in the FAST Act, and that is for uh, safety and rail infrastructure improvements. It's not a huge program. It's about $60 million, but this is the first time there's been a competitive grant program specifically for, for uh, passenger and freight rail projects. And the last one I wanted to point out was the Advanced Transportation and Congestion Management Technologies Deployment Program, ATC MTD, the worst named program in the history of the world, um, which I would encourage the Trump administration to rename something snappier. Um, personally, I can never remember it unless it is written down. Um, and that is likely uh, also to be something that we can see out uh, in the fall. And this is, this is where a lot of the smart cities 
uh, projects are being funded. Um, this is all about deploying innovative technologies that address and other transportation priorities. So on the next slide, how can you take advantage of those competitive grant programs? Um, to the extent that the programs are, are more easily determined, like the fast lane program, I think the, the way that was implemented the last two rounds, the sorts of priorities they set, it's likely to be pretty similar. It's very similar types of projects they'll be looking for because it is it's a very narrow group of projects they're looking for. You can get, you can figure out what projects would fit into that bucket now. So, you know, start to, to identify which projects you think match up well with each of those programs and start to prepare them. You want to, before announcements are made that the, the funding is available, secure partnerships. And by partnerships, I mean funding partners as well as you know, staffing partners or just supportive entities. Know who they are and what their roles are. You want to seek champions for each of these projects, um, both in terms of uh, political leaders, but also just in your community. You want those folks that are going to be able to make the case for it. Um, make sure you share those priorities with your congressional delegation because, um, I mean, when, when I ran the TIGER program, it mattered a lot to us what the congressional delegation said. It was not enough to hear that they supported a project if we really didn't like it, but we always had too many projects to fund and too little money. So knowing that the congressional delegation was behind one project uh, or prioritized it more highly than another, that was an excellent tiebreaker for us. I mean, these were our funders, so we let them break the ties. And I'm sure that they will have, the new administration will have at least the same priority for congressional um, interest. And a, a technique that very few places use, but I highly encourage, is invite the agency leaders to come out and see the project you plan to apply for funding long before an actual competition is underway. So, for example, if you're thinking of putting in a fast lane project this fall and you can get Secretary Chow, or the deputy secretary or someone like that out to the district to see this project now, great idea because it just brings the project way up to the top of their mind. And you, you got to remember that they're going to be judging hundreds upon hundreds of projects from across the country in places they've never been to. It just makes that project more real and more tangible to them. And that is always an advantage. Um, so that, that's my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions after the SACOG gang talks about what this budget means uh, for the SACOG region. Great. Well, thanks so much, Beth. Uh, very, very insightful. I've got my own questions lined up. Um, and by the way, if you do have questions, and I hope you do, uh, this, is, this webinar is sort of uh, chat enabled. So uh, you need to look in, the, in your screen there. There's the ability for you to email, basically chat those questions into us, and we'll cover them after we hear from our next speaker, who is our very own Matt Carpenter, uh, the Director of Transportation Services here at SACOG. I'm sure you all know him. If not, you, you need to get to know him. And he's going to tell us a little bit more, kind of bring it home down to our six-county region, uh, exactly what the budget means for us here regionally and how you can take advantage of that and also how you can uh, really interact with us uh, as the staff here at SACOG to provide you some assistance. So take it away, Matt. Great. Well, thank you, James. And we really appreciate folks taking the time to participate in the webinar today and learn a bit more about what federal uh, transportation opportunities are here for the region. Um, next slide. Um, I just want to start by just offering a bit of background on funding in our region. Uh, these two pie charts, what they do is they just illustrate how much of the 20-year budget in our long-range transportation plan we expect to come from federal sources. Um, as Beth um, pointed out, federal transportation funding has become relatively flat in, in recent years. And while we don't have any certainty this will change, uh, we did benefit from some um, one-time or unexpected opportunities, such as the infrastructure stimulus uh, back in 2009. And we may very well see that again, as you heard from Beth, um, with the administration and some in Congress signaling that we may see a transportation package later this year, it's time for us to get ready now. Now, while the total federal share of our region's transportation budget is quite small, it is a very important slice of the pie. 
Um, federal revenues have over time become much more stable and predictable than local revenues in our region. And a lack of stability was very much also the case with state revenues until the recent passage of Senate Bill 1. What we see in our region is that federal funding is especially important for transit capital and operations um, projects. That 14% blue size of the federal funding for transit, it really helps buffer the volatility and sales tax based sources that have become the largest revenue um, stream for transit. And as described in a state called white paper that's on our website, we definitely are tracking right now federal transit funding and, and how much at risk it has been in the budget proposal from the Trump administration and some influential interest groups. Um, next slide, please. The, this slide kind of covers some competitive road and freight funding, and it really picks up or builds upon some of the um, introductory comments that you heard from Beth Osborne. What you see here is this pie chart illustrates in green that the competitive funding share it's really only about 10% of the total of federal program that comes of revenues that come to our region. And while it's a smaller share of the pie than our transit program, it really provides some important opportunities for our region. Um, competitive road and freight funding um, uh, really comes in two types. There's both competitive grants that target certain types of investment, and then there's really kind of financing instruments, so essentially ways to, to leverage local dollars with federal um, loan terms. The rest of the pie you see there in gray is just basically highway funding that comes as a guaranteed formula funding through the federal transportation bill. And after we received that initial 5% bump in the first year of the FAST Act, our region's only expected to see an increase of about 2% annually for most fundamental highway funding during the final three years of the federal bill. And as with transit funding, this 2% growth is just basically keeping up with inflation. So it puts even more of an emphasis on trying to chase competitive dollars. I just want to um, offer a couple um, capital grant opportunities to mention. Um, one of them is the Fast Lane program that Beth had highlighted. Um, this is a, a pretty large program in the um, Fast Act, but the challenge we've had in our region in the first round is that we have a limited number of projects that meet the high project minimum. And we saw, at least in the first round, how, how much the competition and how fierce it is. Um, mega projects such as access improvements to the ports in Oakland and Los Angeles had competitive advantages in the first round. So we're really looking at ways to add creative partnerships for any projects that go forward in the um, third round that's coming up. Um, but despite the, 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 the criteria challenges with this program, we really want to do what we can to help our region compete with the fast lane grants. And we also want to work with local agencies to help you realize how this may also um, fit with federal, um, excuse me, freight funding that's coming forward through a new, new state program that's getting shaped. Um, an update on that new state freight program, which has some similar criteria, at least we expect it to have some similar criteria to Fastlane. Um, it's, you can read more about that in a staff report that will be coming to our June board meeting. Another uh, grant opportunity includes kind of two separate federal grant programs related to transportation technology. And together, um, these grants, as uh, mentioned by Beth, they're kind of they're ways to implement smart city strategies. And they're authorized for $130 million a year through 2020. Um, the one that's really active right now is that Advanced Transportation and Congestion Management Technologies Deployment Program. Um, it's a mouthful. And that program, that Smart Mobility Program, is really an opportunity to bring together integrated strategies. We are currently working with some local agencies and Caltrans on a proposal for this cycle, but there's also an opportunity here for local agencies to work with us over the next year to identify competitive projects for future cycles. Um, this can happen through local agency collaborations with us on this major effort we're starting this summer to update our intelligent transportation system or ITS network architecture and at the same time prepare an action plan for new transportation technologies. We intend this action plan to really focus on funding strategies to implement pilots and demonstration projects since this is a new area for our region but one where I think we have considerable promise. What we hope from, from doing pilots and demonstration projects is that we'll will identify some good projects both to, to go after this federal grant program as well as other federal funding that we expect in the future. Um, you know, as you heard a bit about the TIGER program, it's, immense, it's important to mention here because that $500 million that was appropriated for the current fiscal year budget. And as you may know, our region has competed well in prior cycles of this program, so it's important to be tracking the, pro the program guidelines and getting ideas forward. Um, we've had a diversity of projects uh, get funded in the past, including projects in the Port of West Sacramento, the downtown intermodal station in Sacramento, the Broadway Bridge project development, and Live Oak Highway 99. Uh, here at SACOG, we have a wealth of data and maps that we've offered and provided for prior TIGER applicants, and we really encourage you to reach out to us as the, 
next round of TIGER funding guidelines are released. Um, the other category, the other point to just talk about road and freight is that there are some important financing instruments that are kind of um, going to be helpful, we think, for some of the uh, agencies in our region. Um, early signals from the Trump administration suggest that financing and public-private partnerships will be an increasing federal policy focus. And although we don't really have specific details right now, um, or the, the resources are somewhat limited, we do expect more information soon, and we'll do our best to ma match folks both with information that's readily available as well as contacts for looking at potentially um, loan opportunities. One change that I mentioned that, uh, for a, a familiar program for many is the, um, the TIFIA program, the Loan Program, the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act. Um, but we will caution folks that this is a program that has shrunk from a billion dollars back in 2015 to just about 300 million last year. Um, we have had local agencies look at TIFIA loans and we've tried to work with them to match them to um, federal highway contacts, but there have been some challenges in trying to work out the specifics of the deal. Um, so we are interested in trying to continue to work with those that are interested, but we also want to remind folks that there is an opportunity with TIFIA um, in the new federal bill, and that's related to transit-oriented development projects. It can be as small as $10 million. Um, they're both eligible now for TIFIA and a similar financing tool at the Federal Rail Administration if you happen to be located near a rail um, station. Other federal financing initiatives we want to mention include establishing the Innovative Finance Bureau and some um, the effort in the federal bill to reauthorize state infrastructure banks. Um, it's hard right now to forecast how much impact either instrument will have in our region, but it's likely to be um, a promising opportunity as state legislation proposals are expected in the next year or two um, about growing the California Infrastructure Bank. And we'll certainly be keep keeping our stakeholders updated on any new developments there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, federal Transit Program is a completely um, is a somewhat different I I issue and that you can see here the competitive funding share is nearly a quarter of the total um, share of federal transit funding that would come to the region over time. Um, capturing federal transit funding levels has long been a focus of SACOG's federal advocacy efforts. Um, last year, we were really pretty much playing offense. We thought our region was well positioned to compete well for the increases in funding through the transportation bill. And for example, there was a notable increase in the amount available for New Start's six guideway projects during the first year of the bill. Um, and we benefited from that with a downtown riverfront streetcar. That project received $50 million in the, um, the current year appropriations bill, um, which is a big deal for the region. Now, for the next fiscal year, though, we, we are, as, as Beth kind of pointed out, there's a need to kind of play some defense. Um, the administration's proposed budget recommends some large cuts in some of the um, transit competitive programs, essentially not going forward with some. Um, and we, you know, we really want to make sure that we're doing everything we can together to advocate for uh, making sure that we um, can get Congress to still see the merit of the competitive programs. For example, one of the real focused efforts in our region, of course, is to work hard to secure the other $50 million in funding for the streetcar that has been marked up previously and advocating for other competitive transit programs that we see some real benefit and promise for our region. What you can see in the pie chart is the other, the gray area, and that's the formula funding um, that just has come through the federal bill. And in terms of federal funding, a formula funding. Um, this is similar to the highway side, where just an increase of 2% annually over most programs for the remainder of the federal bill. And given that we're just keeping up with the rate of inflation and our costs and our needs are great in our region for transit, it's really essential we continue to look at these competitive grant opportunities. Um, we do see some really um, important uh, in terms of looking at some of these federal transit grant opportunities. And I just want to highlight a few examples of opportunities we see over the coming year. Um, as you heard from Beth Osborne, um, the Federal Rail Program is working now on guidelines for a program called CRISI. Um, that call for projects is expected to happen this fall. And early efforts to kind of be prepared um, are coming forward through a state called work, Rail Working Group, a regional working group to identify projects um, along the Capitol Corridor, San Joaquin Rail Corridor that could be competitive. Um, we also are trying to link the opportunities with the CRISI program with an increase in cap and trade funding for inner city rail that's expected to grow even larger than previous cycles as Senate Bill 1 is implemented. That funding comes through what's called the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. So we could provide you more background on our success in earlier cycles of that and how we see that um, linking to federal rail opportunities. Um, another program, um, an important one that Beth mentioned, is the Federal Bus and Bus Facilities Grant Program. Um, our region, of course, has significant needs um, that could be competitive if the proposed cuts by the administration do not happen. We're, we're out ahead of many regions in having a clean fleet, 
and some of the, the really um, deferred uh, rolling stock replacements put us in a good position as long as we can um, effectively um, advocate for having that program get um, funding. It is expected to have uh, 300 million available next year if it was uh, um, out, uh, appropriated up to the authorized level. A couple other um, transit grant programs to highlight. Uh, the Transit Oriented Develop Development Pilot Program is an important source for planning funds that can later lead to capital investments. In 2015, SACOG collaborated with the City of Sacramento on a, su a successful application that received a million dollar award. Um, it's going both towards looking at, of course, uh, streetcar opportunities um, near the certain nodes downtown, as well as helping fund the downtown specific plan. We certainly see that program as perhaps um, a real opportunity for other Sacramento County jurisdictions along either the gold or blue line um, for future cycles. Um, this is also a program that is a real opportunity to perhaps link with the TOD funding program that will be um, part of Measure A. Another program to mention is the Mobility on Demand Sandbox. Um, as, uh, as, you know, this is an important grant program to support transit agencies and communities as they integrate new technology into their services. Some of the examples in our region that are promising include um, smartphone apps uh, that could be linked to uh, the new Connect cards we're going to be fully launching this summer, as well as app, um, opportunities to better um, expand uh, bike and car sharing in our region. Now, it's a small program in terms of the funding available. There was just $8 million in the current fiscal year, but it's a real sign that the um, Federal Transit Administration was responding both to tech, you know, disruptive technologies and an effort to try to support pilot programs. Note that the criteria and the program is quite similar to our TDM Innovations Grant Program, the new program here at SACOG that a number of agencies are tracking. We encourage you to reach out and ask us more if you'd like to understand that program. And then another one just to mention is a small but innovative grant program focused on senior and disabled mobility. In August, um, the SACOG board will be hearing more about a re recent uh, SACOG research effort on this topic. And that research report also includes some strategies that could be implemented through funding on um, this federal program, both by local communities as well as transit providers. Now, we don't have any information yet on the timing for those next funding around for those two competitive transit programs, but we will certainly keep stakeholders updated, and we encourage you now to be thinking about uh, concepts just along that same line of thinking that um, Beth had promoted. Near term, of course, on the transit side, a lot of our focus is on advocating to get these federal programs um, appropriated through the fiscal year 2018 budget. And as part of that effort, we really want to uh, work with local communities and transit agencies to continue making the case how important transit is. Um, and then the final slide, please. Um, I'll end by just offering participants a contact list uh, to answer your questions and take your comments. Now, our focus today has really been on near-term competitive funding programs. I really encourage you to contact uh, me with any questions you may have about federal highway uh, programs and for transit grant programs, please um, contact Sharon Sprawls. The slide you see also offers some context for a broader range of federal policy issues. Um, Clint Holston is a good contact for questions on how federal performance rulemaking will relate to funding um, efforts at SACOG and collaborations both with our local agencies and Caltrans. And then for federal legislation and kind of um, federal coordination, please contact Eric Johnson. Um, as, as noted at the beginning of the call, Eric's also on the webinar today and can answer any questions you may have as we end. Again, I, think, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about what we're doing at SACOG, and we look forward to interactions with our local agencies in the coming uh, months so that we can um, pursue uh, successfully some of these grant programs. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, that really definitely brought it home, localized it. Um, again, I, I would encourage you, if, you um, if you're at your monitor now, we're, um, we're here, we're ready to answer questions, chat them in. Um, have any so far, so I hope that's not a sign of uh, people aren't excited and getting their sharpening their pencils and putting their grant applications together. Um, I got a couple of questions that certainly struck me during the presentations. Um, so, so Beth, we talked a lot about, and uh, we're hearing from the president this week about the infrastructure kind of package, the principles that they want to follow. Um, do you? What's your? You know, we are we are California, but as you well know too, we're a we're a very purple region. We're a we're a bipartisan region, tripartisan region. What's your best advice to us, in addition to having Zhao come out here and uh, visit some 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 great projects that we we have that we'd love to get funded? But what's your best advice for us in terms of how to really help shape that infrastructure package in D.C.? 
Yeah, I think a lot of it is uh, understanding that the team putting it together has uh, is not full of people that have worked at actual agencies. And so it might uh, need some folks from uh, your MPO, from your state DOT, from city agencies talking about how some of these different proposals work uh, in action. And uh, at least from my initial interactions with folks, at USDOT, there are some folks over there that are, are very open to hearing that. I think the other thing is, you know, listening carefully to what they're proposing and then giving them honest feedback about what their proposals can do for your region and what they can't. So I'll give you an example. Um, financing mechanisms can be extremely useful. They tend to be more useful for building something big and new, especially something new that might come with a, uh, a revenue stream to pay it back. But it's not particularly handy for maintenance uh, or for keeping uh, you know, our system in a state of repair. Maybe for a massive new construction in some cases, especially if you can add a new tollway or something like that, maybe a, replace a bridge with a new toll bridge or something along those lines. But otherwise, uh, it, it's not as helpful in that area. So going to them and saying, you know, this proposal for a, a broad new TIPIA program uh, would be very helpful for these projects that we have in our region. But they don't really help with these specific projects, and let me tell you why, and involve them in what you are trying to accomplish so that um, there's some clarity in, in where their ideas are useful and where, where their limitations are. We are hearing a lot of backlash in Congress, especially from uh, House members and rural uh, Senate or senators who represent large rural areas, that they're very concerned about the focus on financing, that they think that uh, urban areas will do much better in that area um, in attracting private investment and attracting, fi attracting financing than rural areas will. I think that they're absolutely correct on that. And a lot of what we have to do is just start to explain the difference between financing and funding. You know, it's the difference between being given a mortgage on a house and being given a house. And so, you know, the, there are places where you being given a mortgage to build a new bridge is helpful, but there are places where a grant or a co-investor is really what's needed. That's great. Thanks, Beth. Um, Hey Matt, if if I'm on the webinar today and I'm listening to uh, both of your presentations about all these competitive grant programs, let's just sort of take Tiger or Fastlane two and three as an example, and I've got ideas in my head, right, about wow, I've got a really great good, goods moving project, or I've got a really great um, downtown revitalization, um, you know, complete street project. Where, where do I? What's your advice on where I start? How do I? Where do I begin if I'm just at the no, conceptual level? It's an, it's an excellent question. It's one where I'd encourage you to um, just uh, perhaps consider the contacts on the final slide and just reach out to us for the programs in those general areas. What we sometimes are able to offer early is just to let one jurisdiction know about maybe a next door jurisdiction is looking for something similar because sometimes partnerships is really a key to being competitive. And so whether it's being able to kind of match folks to other ideas we know about, but it also is an opportunity to perhaps uh, let you know how to navigate um, our, the data and um, maps that we have readily available that can help strengthen an application or help you better test a concept early. Um, so as you're starting to think about ideas, um, we, we, we can also, we can be a sounding board, we can also be, um, we can be circumspect about it too. There so have been cases where folks wanted to reach out to us but didn't want too many people to know. Um, we can handle it either way, but we, we do find sometimes a dialogue is helpful because we sometimes have unique um, insights to offer. We also of course, can coordinate with our experts at Transportation for America on some um, getting questions answered um, in D.C. that folks may have. So however we can be a resource, both in identifying or brainstorming the initial idea, as well as matching you to resources for a potential application, um, are places where we'd love to, to have those discussions well before the notice of funding availability come out. You know, by the that time, everybody's chasing um, for a deadline. Great, great thanks. Uh, and with that, we we are at time. I just want to thank uh, I want to thank both our presenters, uh, Beth and Matt. Uh, I will say for those of you um, on the webinar, the slides are actually already posted. If you're interested in these slides, you can download them from our website. Uh, we will actually make <clears throat> make this recording available as well, and that will probably be up in 
two or three days, maybe the beginning of next week. And then finally, really, as Matt said, we put that last slide up there so that you all know that we are we are here as a resource for each and every one of our members and our jurisdictions. So please do not hesitate to reach out, whether it's an early concept you have for a project or it is a, a grant maybe you've already put, you put in and you didn't get awarded, so you're trying to figure out how to be more competitive. A any of those scenarios, uh, we, we would be really um, delighted to be working with you, uh, have you give us an early heads up and figure out how we can help you as best we can. So, so thanks again to our presenters, um, thanks to our technical team here at SACOG, and for each and every one of you for joining. Uh, please be in touch and uh, check out the website, and there will be more webinars coming soon. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much again.